Justin Garcia at the Jungle Gym in the Bronx. Tell me, why jiu-jitsu? Why not karate or kickboxing or judo? Well, it's not really just jiu-jitsu anymore. You know, I have a foundation in jiu-jitsu. Um, when uh, when I, I'm in a fight, you know, my hands are, are talking jiu-jitsu. But uh, my mind, you know, it hasn't been just jiu-jitsu in a, in, in a long time now. Uh, nor do I think anybody that's really done any MMA or, you know, has fought in any type of or trained in any type of mixed format, I don't think they're jiu-jitsu anymore. You know, people, uh, you know, I, I'm comfortable with being called a jiu-jitsu guy. You know, I am a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Um, I've been a black belt for a little over seven years now. Uh, but, you know, to say that everything I do is jiu-jitsu is, you know, it's just inaccurate. You know, it's really no value judgment. It's just, it's just inaccurate. So, you know, karate, kung fu, all these other styles, they all have value. They all have uh, uh, different value and a lot of times, you know, whereas there may be a, an inherent difference in the, the uh, application or, you know, the, the practicality of an art, you know, a lot of times you're reduced to, well, who's a good instructor, who's a bad instructor. Um, some of the greatest things I've learned as a martial artist, you know, have been from guys who have never done jiu-jitsu. You know, um, I, I'm also a, a practitioner of Saya Kali. And in the, in the Sayak system, you know, which is basically a blade system, you know, everything that has nothing to do with the physical aspect of martial arts um, is second to none. You know, the mental preparation and the, the, the way you process information, the way you strategize, the way that you sort of filter, you know, your, your reality, you know, that has nothing to do with punches or knives even or anything, but, 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 but powerful. So... Jiu-Jitsu, you know, uh, early on, admittedly, I was the guy screaming Jiu-Jitsu, pumping my fist, because that's what I knew, you know, and uh, if we're limited or restricted by who we were and, and what we were at the, uh, the infancy stages of our development, then, uh, then we're really never going to achieve our potential. You know, my guys, uh, right now, they, they train a lot of uh, Jiu-Jitsu, they train a lot of striking, they train a lot of Judo, a lot of wrestling. Um, but probably on par with that uh, uh, is the uh, the conversations that we have before and after training. Sometimes the conversations we have during training. Um, putting ourselves mentally to where I think um, the strongest uh, warrior sort of resides. You know, we have plenty of guys in MMA, and let's you know stick to MMA. You have uh, guys that early on in their career they had this passion, this hunger, and they were fighting like it. They were fighting to finish people. They they had this mentality. I, I only had two pro fights, and I think you were at both of them. But, um, you know, I remember telling myself consciously, one of us is getting finished today. You know, either I'm getting fucking finished or he's getting finished. There's no way that uh, this is going to a decision. And that's a mentality I always wanted to keep. Um, and it's a mentality I keep in my fighters. You know, do we want to win? Absolutely. But never do I want to win... Um, with a strategy that's designed by not losing, you know, and uh, that's not jujitsu. You know, jujitsu is first and foremost a self-defense art. You know, it's 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 all about not losing. You know, and if you're talking about dominant behavior and you know pressuring people to be more powerful, you know, uh, having a, a self-defense perspective is is not the road there. It's not the bridge between you know you walking into martial arts school the first day. And you getting into a cage and being successful. You you said the word warrior before, and and that touched on something that I was thinking. Uh, watching your guys fight in the cage and, and watching videos of you guys training, uh, it seems like Jungle Gym isn't so much a school that produces like jujitsu competitors or fighters as much as it produces warriors. Can you touch on or expand on that a little more? I'm a big believer in uh, a phrase and a mentality. Um, that we label pressure to power. And what it means is you should never be comfortable in your training. Um, it's, it's ironic that I have strength is a product of struggle. This is the shirt I have on today. Um, and that's it in a nutshell. So my guys are pushed to where they need to be pushed. There are certain guys in my school that will, especially early on in, in their training, in their journey, uh, the push and the pressure will come from them doing a grappler's quest. You know, from them doing a... Uh, 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 pajama party, uh, the IBJF event, or something like that. 
Um, there's value in that. And, you know, I joke and I kid. I love watching black belt matches. I love watching, you know, Abu Dhabi matches. I love, I watch them all day long. But it's a different category, and I acknowledge that. You know, my guys here are pushed to where they need to be pushed to. In the beginning, it's going to be that grapplers course. But after a while, um, it may be an MMA fight. Um, it may be sitting down and talking about the, uh, the, the quirks and the inadequacies they have during their training sessions. You know, that might be where the pressure comes from. Uh, some guys, they can compete and it's no big deal. You know, so there really is no pressure there. So do it if you enjoy doing it recreationally. But when you talk about, you know, pressuring yourself to improve and grow, you know, it needs to, it needs to be from someplace else. So consciously what I try to put my guys through is, number one, the acknowledgement that we need to be pressuring ourselves. Um, but then after that, um, the, the embracing of that, of that struggle, the embracing of that pressure. So when you see my guys fight, they're fighting uh, a lot more than their opponent. You know, they're, they're fighting uh, mediocrity, they're fighting their fears, they're fighting um, the, uh, the, the, the sort of expectations or even limitations of everybody that's been around them in their lives up until they join the jungle gym. So uh, we're a very, very tight group of guys. One of my, one of my most proudest aspects of, of my school and my team is that we're all homegrown. And, you know, my guys walk in here not knowing anything, and the guys that you see in the cage submitting people, knocking people out, you know, and we lose a couple, don't get me wrong, like I don't have the, the magic potion in the back here, but all my guys, you know, they started here and they're a member of here, members of here, and uh, as long as they're, you know, that they're a, a loyal uh, member of the tribe, you know, the tribe has their back 100% of the time, and that's what you see when my guys show up to fight. So you've had... Um some guys with some real serious success. So I'm thinking uh, Joe Aviles was a ring combat champ. When he had fights coming up, you didn't uh, have Joe like seek out people from other schools or other styles to train with them to just to get a feel for like how the opponent would be. Well, I have very specific opinions on, uh, and they're not always popular. But when it comes to developing a fighter, um, I'll uh, I'll sort of default to the to the pressure concept. And there are going to be times where, you know, preparing uh, for a specific opponent is going to warrant you being exposed to that specific pressure, you know. And those times, I will certainly, you know, reach out to, to friends in the, uh, you know, in the MMA world and, and have guys come in and, you know, give them that presentation to allow him to start preparing for that and seeing it. Um, to say otherwise is, is ridiculous, you know. Um, but rather than embrace the, the current uh, mindset that people need to go from one school to the next, learning from this guy, learning from that guy to be better, um, I think that's complete bullshit, you know. I would much rather uh, put forth the uh, NFL team model where you have the starters and you have the scout team. You know, you need people to give you a good look, you know, but when it comes to the strategies and preparations of a, of a bout, you know, and a, and a fighter for an individual match, you know, there needs to be unity, there needs to be uh, a sort of uh, clean and clear, concise message of what the goal is. Um, I could fit as many tricks into your bag as I can, it doesn't prepare you for the battle, you know, in any, any, uh, any better. So, for me, uh, my guys train here. If there is somebody who, uh, one of my guys who I want to develop uh, their striking ability more, or beyond what I admittedly am, uh, am either capable of or uh, willing to have the time to do, you know, I will certainly reach out to a friend, bring the friend in to work with my guys, you know, but to me the tribe is, is above everything, you know, so when the, the individual that wants to make it, we will back you 100%. And as soon as the person uh, thinks that we can no longer get them there and has aspirations of going beyond uh, what, you know, what he thinks that we can do here, then time for him to go, you know. And, and I'm not the one that says, you know, if you're not with me, you're against me. But if you're not with me, you're not with me, you know. So, say la vie. <laughs> Uh, you fought twice MMA. What was the impetus behind that, getting into the ring and fighting, and, and why did you stop? Pressure. I hate competing. 
I hated fighting. Absolutely hated it. I hated the preparation. I hated thinking everybody I'm pretty well established. I have a school that's up and running. We win tournaments, everything. What if I go in and fight and get knocked the fuck out? <laughs> that is going to pull the rug out from everything I've been trying to build all these different years. But that's exactly why I had to do it. Um, I hated fighting. I uh, I enjoy training. I enjoy pressuring myself. I enjoy the benefits, the rewards, the accolades that you get from being successful. Um, but going through it, I hated it. You know, uh, why am I not fighting MMA anymore? How come I only fought twice? I didn't fight after. Um, well, there was you know shows fell apart and you know the. the normal things that happened back when I was fighting or, you know, would happen, but um, the big thing was it wasn't a challenge anymore. It's like, alright, I did that. You know, I checked that box. Now it's what's next, you know, and uh, if anything, I, I think if you look at what I've been doing since I started uh, training in, in, in jiu-jitsu, you know, it's been one series of challenges after the next. In the beginning, it was doing just grappling tournaments. And I got lucky enough to make it to Abu Dhabi. You know, and after that it was MMA, and not only did I fight twice, excuse me, but I, fo I prepared for around 10 fights, you know, only two of them actually happened, which was very commonplace back then, you know. Um, but uh, after that it was, you know, and I got to train with, you know, with, with, with guys of the highest caliber, you know, I got to train with, with, with Hoist, uh, Kenny Florian, I got to pair with him, I got to train with all sorts of guys, so my, it, it enabled me to, to sort of, um, be exposed and get the experience that I wouldn't trade for anything nowadays. But when it was done, it was done. You know, now it's uh, I'm very much in my legacy, you know, mode when it comes to to MMA. I want to build, you know, the, uh, a tribe. You know, I want to build a group of successful people that, you know, are here for each other that are getting into the UFC, that are getting into, you know, the shows like Bellator, that are getting into those high level shows, um, having done nothing but, you know, put their nose down and work hard. You know, so for me, um, I hated competing, but that's exactly why I had to do it. Well, I, having watched you compete, I know that you were good at it. So it's kind of funny that you hated it. It worked out. <laughs> so uh, describe the process. Uh, one of your guys, you know, shows that he has some interest in fighting. Uh, how do you determine he's ready? How do you determine he's ready to do amateur, pro, et cetera, et cetera? Well, everybody trains together, right? The way uh, my school is designed is there's a certain level you get to where you're training in all the classes with the guys that are fighting. So you're training with these guys day in and day out long before, you know, either you express or maybe I approach you, um, which is a rarity, but it's happened before. You know, before that happens, you're already training. So the only things we really do is uh, maybe add and uh, supplement some extra training during the course of the week after a class here, before a class there, um, for the guys that have fights scheduled, you know, and, you know, we got to take care of, you know, conditioning and things like that, and, but you're, they're already training, you know, it's, it's not that I, I pull the guy out of, you know, a, a gi class and I say, look, I think you're ready for the cage, you know, <laughs> it doesn't happen like that, this guy's already got gloves on, he's already been bloodied up in training, it's part of his day-to-day, -day, you know, thing, you know, and it's, it's, it's usually they express and interest. Um, and uh, there are plenty of guys who have fought that I would have loved to have gone up to them and tell them early on, look, I think you should fight. But there's something uh, almost magical about allowing somebody to, to get to the point where they have enough courage to approach the instructor and say, I want to fight. You know, there's something empowering in that, you know, and, and, and sort of identifying yourself as a fighter and wanting to pursue that. You know, me telling you you're a fighter before you're telling yourself you're a fighter isn't as powerful. Well, do you ever, like, someone come up to you and say, I want to fight, and you tell them you're not ready? Um, I tell them all that, you know. Um, but you're not ready, uh, let's get you on a card next month, is different from you're not ready, you know, come see me in another six months. <laughs> and we'll have this conversation again. Uh, the one thing my, uh, my students can rely on me um, is to always be as straight a shooter as they will ever meet. Um, I, I am not going to sugarcoat anything. I am not going to lie to them. I, I'm going to be perfectly honest and a lot of times as blunt as I could possibly be. I believe in the uh, 
the uh, and, and sort of being efficient when it comes to things like that in communication, you know, between a, an instructor and a student. And not every student can take that, but you know, I'm going to tell it like it is. You know, some guys I will tell. You know, you you can barely fucking do a standing base, and you want me to put you in a cage. You know, and, and I need to weed out uh, the the people, or at least the mentality of some people that uh, they just want to do it so they could say they're a part of it. They just want to do it because they want to wear the outfit. They want the picture, you know, before their fight. They don't want to actually pressure themselves. You know, they want the accolades without the the effort. You know, so I weed those guys out. What's uh, the most rewarding thing you've felt or you've experienced as a coach, as a trainer? <sighs> That's a tough one. Um, probably... Probably the most powerful thing I've had was a, a student <clears throat> come into come into my uh, my office one day, and uh, I'm not a big proponent of watching grown men cry, right? Uh, but came came in and basically uh, dissected how what his life or how his life changed from the moment he came in and started training to the moment that he was sitting down narrating his story and uh, hearing some of the things that he was going through that I had no idea about um, because kudos to, him, kudos to him he didn't let anybody know about it he just he dealt with his shit while uh, sort of benefiting from the energy and the support of the group um, but uh, hearing where he was now and, and you know like this was uh, drugs were involved and homelessness and, you know, unemployment and, you know, children and, you know, it was about as epic a, a depressing story. It's, it's sort of like, I'm so glad I got to hear the story at its conclusion, you know, <laughs> and uh, not in the middle of the, you know, the, the middle of it. And uh, hearing how he took every little bit of thing, every little bit of um, sort of advice that was given, just the daily just being here, you know, and not just for me, you know, I'm not saying that he took all my wisdom and applied it to his life and it became awesome, you know. He uh, he, he just, he he strung together this story that, that showed how what we did here brought him from the depths of something I hope I never have to endure. And that's why I do this, you know. Um, yeah, guys win fights. Guys are like, who gives a shit, you know. You know who's going to win fights? The good fighters, you know, who's going to win tournaments? The good competitors, you know, like, t show me a guy that has absolutely zero talent, that wins a match, you know, in a grapplers quest. That'll always be more impressive to me than the guy who was built like a freaking Greek god, you know, that was taught, that has a wrestling background, that came in here and knocked somebody out in a regional amateur MMA card, you know. Um, but nobody, everybody yells and screams for the guy that knocks the guy out in the amateur fight. And they, oh, yeah, you're a warrior, this and that. But the, the poor uh, schlep that could do nothing, has never played a sport in his life, that the guy, the first day you, you, he started training, he's the, the, the type of guy that you grab, and, you know, he, he tenses up because he feels like he's about to be assaulted. You know, in what way, I don't know, by his reaction. You know, and you get him to the point where he believes in himself enough that he could actually go out there and compete, number one, but then actually have any degree of success, that's impressive. That's impressive, you know. Um, like I said, I love watching a high-level co uh, competition, but the world isn't made of, of, of high-level competitors, you know. So it's, it's to me, the, the bridge from the, the bottom to the top is, that's the value of what we do, you know. Not finding, you know, ma making a great sword out of the best steel, you know. No, win a win a war with with wooden stakes. You know that's impressive to me. Do you have any regrets? Any disappointments? Regrets and disappointments, two different things. Yeah. You know, disappointment is something that went bad. You know, uh, regret is uh, something that I wish I had done differently. I think uh, congruent to the you know pressure model of of, of my philosophy, um, I think I had to learn a lot. I think I had to go through a lot. I think I had to um, get angry. I had to get pissed off. I had to, be, you know, be depressed. I had to, I had to go through all these different things to understand 
um, all the different elements to, to what it is to be a, a mentor, to be a leader, to be a coach. And uh, I wouldn't change any of it, you know, because when I look at what I have now, what I've built um, internally in, in, in this school, and even my network of friends outside the school, you know, because it's not just, you know, just the jungle gym. Um, I belong to a lot of different sort of tribes, I guess you could say. Um, I wouldn't change anything because I'm surrounded by the, the greatest people I've ever known right now. And I think that's that's one of one of the goals that we should aspire to. You know, do the best work and know the best people right now. You know, and if, if that's staying the same and you're the guy that's talking about remember when and remember, you know, I don't want to be that guy, you know. Oh, the good old days. No, my, you know what's the best day for me? Tomorrow. You know, the only thing better than today is tomorrow. You know, I don't want to talk about yesterday. All right. You, for your students and for your fighters, you obviously regulate their training. Do you control, like, their diet, um, social aspects? I mean, how much, how much influence do you exert over your guys? I do. The guys that fight, the guys that really uh, want to invest and dedicate time in being high-level competitors, um, I uh, go to the gym with them. I'm their strength and conditioning coach. And not here. We go to a local gym. And... Uh, we, I teach them how to lift weights. I teach them how to supplement. I teach them, you know, what they should be eating. Uh, you know, more protein, less less junk food is usually the gist of the any nutritional advice I'll give them. But um, I uh, I want to make sure that if I can't answer something that they need answered, that I find the answer for them. You know, so uh, even though I'm not an expert at everything, I am certainly the most motivated person. To help my guys that they know. There was a video posted, I think you posted it a while back, of uh, your guys in some backyard getting pepper sprayed. Yeah, OC spray. Yeah. Ex- explain that. It was, it was probably one of the most incredible days of training that I've ever experienced as a, as an instructor, and it's one of those things that. Most people aren't going to understand. Most people are, what does this have to do with MMA? And, you know, and, you know, banter is good. Conflict is good. Conversation is good. Um, especially in the day of SEO, right? Um, building a lot of traffic for your websites. Uh, but when it comes down to it, everybody was scared shitless, myself included, to be sprayed. And again, that's exactly why we had to do it. You know, it was safe. Um, it was proctored by uh, by a police officer who actually does this for a police academy that I could not mention. But uh, you see on the video, he was blacked out and everything. and So it was all done the same way that it's done for the police academy, according to the proctor that ran it. And he was one of my students. Um, and it was, it was terrible. <laughs> it was probably the, the the scariest, most claustrophobic, like terrorizing uh, thing I've ever done. You know, and and I've I've I'm a firm believer in pressure, like I said, so I put myself through some shit. And it's all mental. You know, it's all mental. I'm not trying to build up a tolerance to pepper spray. I'm not trying to show my guys that you could fight blind like blood sport when you punch the guy in the nuts. You know, like it has nothing to do with that. It's all about you know, this is safe, it's not going to kill us, um, and we're all terrified of it. We need to do this, you know. So I'm always looking for ways to, uh, to, to, to apply different lessons to sort of broaden people's mindsets, you know. I remember a video I put up of one of my guys, and it's just a, it's like, an, like, it happens all the time, one of my striking classes, I had my guys kicking each other in the leg, right, and, um, you know, raw, you know, it was shin on thigh, and it was like the end of the class, the end of a talk about, you know, mindset stuff, about uh, the, what we're showing to our opponent during the course of a fight, and, you know, trying to find a way to sort of kill all the boogeymen that live in our heads, you know, and so that we're not scared of things that aren't there. There's plenty there to be scared of, and, you know, it was along the lines of that, and I put the video up, and sometimes, you know, I, I guess I have these naive moments where I don't realize how things must look to somebody who isn't part of this experience. And oh my God, it was, I was lambasted all over the forums. Um, I had people sending me uh, messages 
all anonymous for some reason, uh, telling me I was a fraud, I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> and, you know, to me it's hilarious because I'm right now, who knows, fucking 70, 80 pounds heavier than I was when I fought, right, so I look like a fat guy that doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about, but, um, you know, a lot of guys, what, what you'll get is, you get the guys really going in on me, not know I'm a fraud, I don't know, just like that, and they're very they're animated, and then... After like you know a, a couple of hours, they disappear, and it's like oh, okay, he found the Google page that that showed my fights on it, and he realized that I wasn't a fraud, and, he re and then they become sort of uh, uh, less irate. But um, people are never going to understand, you know, what I do with my students to make them better, and um, I like it that way. You know, I like it that way. My guys love it. My guys understand what they're doing, uh, what's going on. But uh, the outside, I think even Joe Rogan, that that freaking. Ugh, <laughs> schmuck um, posted on uh, on the kicking one he called it retarded or something like that and I was like alright Joe I'll show you retarded <laughs> well I mean you've trained fighters he hasn't so cool. there's a I had this I when he posted I remember sharing a picture of when I was in Abu Dhabi in 2005 and there's a picture with me um, who was it it was me it was Felicia O I think was in the picture Hi, Felicia. You see this? Uh, and uh, Eddie Bravo and Joe Rogan. And uh, I had on, everybody had on their ID tags, and mine said fighter. And he, his said VIP. And it was like, this is the perfect presentation of what my position on Joe Rogan is. It's like, enjoy your commentating, fucking schmuck. 